so let's start in. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for the opening prayer, we'll do the prayer, the Anima Christi prayer. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. Oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Apart from you, let me never be. From the enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me. And close to you, bid me that with your saints, I may always be praising you eternally. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So our topic for today is the, the last of our um, series on the heresies. And so we'll look at the Council of Chalcedon, which is the fourth ecumenical council. And in many ways, it's like the capstone of the, of the great councils of the first millennium. There were others after it, obviously, but, um, but it really summarizes the doctrine about Christ in, in a beautiful way. So I've got a um, PowerPoint, a second. And can you see that? Great. Okay, so basically the theme is Jesus is perfect man and perfect God, right? So that's in one person. So that sums up Christological doctrine. It's, it's not that hard in, in one sense. Obviously it's the greatest of mysteries, but um, to stay on, on track, in other words, to be orthodox with regard to um, Christology, there are three fundamental things. Right? Jesus is true man and perfect man. Jesus is true God and perfect God, right? Consubstantial with the Father in divinity, consubstantial with us in humanity, and he's one person in the two natures, right? So that's those three things, perfect God, perfect man, and one person in the two natures sums up the church's faith. Obviously, that just... Um, that doesn't enable us to understand, right? But it enables us not to go astray. Okay. So, so last time we saw the Nestorian heresy and we saw how Nestorius separated Christ into two separate subjects or persons, right? The person of the son of God and the person of the man, Jesus. And the problem with that is Jesus is one and spoke of himself as one, he uses one I, and before Abraham was, I am, right? And that refers both to the humanity and to the divinity. So that's how we see he's one person um, who before Abraham was, eternally is as God, and yet was born 2000 years after Abraham in his humanity. Right? And so the Council of Ephesus that we looked at last time declared that Jesus was, in fact, one person, and, and that his two natures were united in that one person. And there's a technical term, hypostatic union. Hypostatic means um, personal union, right? So fancy name, hypostatic union, but in English, we could say union in one person, right? That's the meaning. Now, 15 years after the great council of um, Ephesus, or and 20 years, and there was another opposite heresy, and similar to the heresy that we looked at earlier of Apollinaris that denied the full humanity of Jesus, right? And so this happens again. And, and it um, was initiated by a um, abbot, an elderly pious abbot in Constantinople who had a great reputation for piety and holiness named Eutyches. And, and so Eutyches um, stressed the union right, that Ephesus defined, hypostatic union, but um, overemphasized the union and um, in such a way that he denied the distinction of natures in Christ. And that would mean denying his full humanity. Right? And basically, both Nestorius and Eutyches 
are starting from the same principle, we could say philosophical principle, that is person and nature have to go together, right? So if there is one person, there's gotta be one combined nature. That's what Eudekis thought. Whereas Nestoria said, if there are two natures, there've gotta be two persons or subjects, right? So they're coming to opposite conclusions, but starting from the same kind of presupposition, person and nature go together. Right. So Eudekis put this forward um, as the teaching of um, the Council of Ephesus and St. Cyril of Alexandria. And it, it wasn't, right? It's a heresy. But nevertheless, he was putting it forward as if it were orthodoxy. Um, and it had a tragic outcome. This It, um, it led to um, the Great Council of Chalcedon, 451, but it also ended up with a large portion of Christendom separating, and that would be in the province of Egypt, right, which was gigantic. Um, and this led to um, a weakening of Christian unity in North Africa that aided the spread of Islam short a uh, couple centuries later. Okay, so Eudekes um, claimed that his doctrine was that of St. Cyril and St. Athanasius, the two great heroes of defenders of the faith that we looked at in our last two talks. But in reality, he was putting forth the doctrine of Apollinaris of Laodicea, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, um, who we looked at um, last time at the beginning, um, who basically said that the Logos took the place of Jesus's rational soul. The Logos took the place of his intellect and will. And the problem with that is he wouldn't be truly man, right? He would be truly God, but not truly man. Um, now Apollinaris um, and his followers spread his doctrine by forging documents. That's a little harder today, right? We know that, yes, forging and lying is continuous um, in the world. But um, in, the, um, in the first millennium, it was easier to do that, right? Because you didn't have libraries and there was not as much access to, um, to manuscripts. And so if you forged a few copies, it, they tended to spread um, with less ability to check them. And so the followers of Apollinaris and forged documents attributed to St. Athanasius um, and deceived people like St. Cyril of Jerusalem, I'm uh, sorry, of Alexandria. And so St. Cyril um, adopted a phrase of the heretic Apollinaris thinking it was by the St. Athanasius. And the phrase was one incarnate nature of the word or logos. And that's not right, right? Because in Jesus, we said two natures. God and man. But to preserve the unity and um, highlighting the, the unity, um, Apollinaris said one incarnate nature, which he understood to be a kind of blend, right? The logos and humanity making up one new incarnate nature, right? And that's heresy. But um, Saint um, Cyril of Alexandria thought that it was a phrase by Saint Athanasius. So he was respectful of his great predecessor's language which wasn't Athanasius' language. And so um, anyway, Cyril talked this way, but this, this leads to an important lesson. In theology, like in so many other things, what's important is not actually the form of words so much as what is the meaning or substance of what a person um, is saying, right? And so it's what St. Cyril meant in speaking of one incarnate nature was one incarnate person and that the person of the Logos wasn't changed by taking on flesh, All right? So that's what he, and we can see from this that in the first millennium, in the fifth century, um, the terms nature and person weren't so well defined as they became as a result of this controversy, right? So to us, they may still cause confusion when we're learning Christology, but um, we've had the benefit of 15 centuries distinguishing, they answer two different questions, right? Nature answers the question, what is it, right? And that's generally something common, right? Human, we say. But person answers the question, who is it? And that's something individual, personal, incommunicable, right? So they're very different things, nature and person, right? And in fact, Jesus has two natures, but he's one who, right? He's got two what's but he's one who in those two natures, right? And Cyril knew that, he understood that, but his terminology was um, deficient 
when he spoke of one incarnate nature. And that was unfortunate, right? Because he was the great saint of the Council of Ephesus. And so his prestige led others um, into error against his intention. And one of the, so let's look, the uh, mature Cyril, we can see that he doesn't mean that error, um, one, only one nature, from um, an important letter that he wrote um, in his, after the Council of Ephesus. He wrote this, if we understand the manner of the incarnation, we shall see that the two natures come together with one another without confusion or change. Now he says without confusion, that would be um, the kind of blend that Apollinaris was speaking about, the logos taking the place of the rational soul. So without confusion or change, right? So it's not as if the divinity changes or the humanity um, ceases to be fully human. So without confusion or change in an indivisible union. And so kind of, we have to hold two poles, not a blending, but also the, um, the union and um, the two things are distinct, but they're brought into an indivisible union, right? The flesh is flesh, not Godhead, even though it became the flesh of God. And similarly, the word is God and not flesh, right? The divine nature, even if he made the flesh his very own in the economy. Economy means in the incarnation. Given that we understand this, we do no harm to that concurrence into union when we say it took place out of two natures. After the union has occurred, however, we don't divide the natures from one another, right? That would be two subjects. We don't divide the natures, nor do we sever the one and indivisible into two sons. We saw that Nestorius and his, his um, teachers um, held that two sons. Theodore of Tarsus held that. So only one son, one in, and then he uses this unfortunate phrase, one incarnate nature of the word. We would admit that there are two united natures, but only one Christ and one son and one Lord, right? So St. Cyril got it right, the doctrine, but he's used a, mis a, um, a misleading terminology that leads into the next heresy, um, one naturism. And it's got, I'm sorry, it's got a fancy um, Greek name, monothocytism, but it literally means one naturism. And so it's the heresy of thinking that there's one blended or composite nature in Christ, all right? And so Cyril uses this um, in a good way, but nevertheless, it leads others astray. But we can see that Cyril is excluding two errors, the two opposite heresies, no confusion or change and no separation or division, such that there would be two sons, right? Separation or division would be Nestorius and confusion or change would be Apollinaris. And so Cyril's got it right, but he uses this bad terminology. Okay. All right. St. Cyril dies. And after the death of St. Cyril, he's replaced as a um, patriarch of Alexandria by um, um, a disciple named Dioscorus, um, who unfortunately is a disciple who um, lacked the balance of his master. So Dioscorus is a kind of... Um, pro-unity, right? He wants to defend the unity of Christ, but he takes it too far into one person, one nature, one composite nature. Um, and, um, and then at the same time in Constantinople, the abbot Eudikis, right? So both of them have the same kind of um, one nature position. Right? So he is, Eudikis said he's of, um, the same being as the father in respect to the humanity, and, but he didn't hold of the same being as us in respect to his humanity. Sorry, did I say that wrong? The same one in being, consubstantial of the father and his divinity, right? And um, the um, St. Cyril said, consubstantial with us in humanity, whereas Dioscorus and Eudikis are denying the second part. He's not consubstantial with us in humanity. And so Eudikis started to denounce Orthodox bishops as being Nestorian because they held two natures. Um, and, um, and so Eudikis then was denounced to his bishop, St. Flavian of Constantinople. So the, the history of this is very kind of, a, it's a good tale, 
as we'll see, um, tragic. So in a synod before his bishop, Eutyches said, yeah, there's only one nature in Christ. He was from two natures, but not in two natures. And it's right, he's from two natures, but he's also in two natures, right? Jesus right now is in two natures. He's, right, God with his father, um, and he's man right now, right? Sitting at the right hand of the father, right? So when we say that in the creed, seated at the right hand of the father, we're affirming that his humanity um, exists now and forever, right? It never ceases. All right, so Eutyches is denying Christ's full human nature. And so um, his bishop, Flavian, um, um, condemned him right? and deposed him and excommunicated him. Tragically, right? Because he was a, an elderly um, abbot. But he had great influence in the imperial court. His godson was the power behind the throne. And so he um, got the support of both the emperor and the patriarch of, of Alexandria, Dioscorus, and he appealed to the Pope, St. Leo the Great. Right, so that's, um, so Leo hears about this, one of the greatest popes in the history of the papacy. And not, there aren't very many the greats, right? So this is one of the few um, popes who get that title. And thanks be to God, he was the Pope at this time. Um, and so he, he gets the letter from Flavian and he immediately writes back a famous letter, one of the most famous papal letters um, to uh, Flavian, which has been called the Tome of Leo, right? Like the Book of Leo. And it's a magnificent document. We'll read some from it in a few minutes. And he says there that Eutyches, who you know, is revealed to be simply ignorant, rash and ignorant. And he thought that he erred more out of ignorance than malice. And he counseled Flavian to pardon him if he were to publicly recant and recite a condemnation of his views. But tragically, he didn't do that. And also even more tragically, the emperor took his part and called a council. All right, so in the first millennium, it's just, so from our point of view today, um, you, the emperor you know, can't call a council. It's gotta be the Pope calling a council. But in the first millennium, it was always the emperor acting and the Pope more or less had to go along with it. And so that's what happened here. So he wrote to the emperor saying, I mean, this point is so obvious that Jesus is a true man that there's no need for a council, right? But nevertheless, it had already been called. And so he accepted it, but he excused himself from attending, right? He's across the ocean and well, across the Mediterranean in Rome. And so he sent two legates with his letter, the Tome of Leo. Right. And, and so what happened? The uh, council that was called by the emperor ended up acquitting Eutyches as being orthodox. And not just that, it ended up beating, so there was violence in this council. So it's come down to history as the robber council. Um, and um, it's not counted among the ecumenical councils. Right? So the robber council 449, um, and it should have been led by the papal legates, but instead Dioscorus presided. And um, when the council opened the legates tried to read St. Leo's tome, but um, they were uh, prevented and, um, and chaos broke out. So I'm giving you here the description by St. John Henry Newman of the, of the Robert Council. So Eutyches was honorably acquitted, his doctrine received. Um, people were a little hesitant though, the, the bishops of um, condemning Flavian, who was the Bishop of Constantinople, saintly bishop, Saint Flavian. Um, but Dioscorus came with a bunch of monks from Egypt, right? Like previously Athanasius and Cyril of Alexandria. And these monks um, came with clubs apparently and um, broke into the church and um, there was chaos and um, Flavin was trampled and died three days later. Right? The, the, arch, the patriarch of Constantinople. Um, and um, then the bishops were forced to sign a blank sheet of paper, which was afterwards filled in with the condemnation of Flavian. And um, Dioscorus ended up by excommunicating the Pope. <laughs> and so this was, this was a bad outcome. And the papal legates escaped and fled for their lives and managed to get back to Leo, I don't know, six months later or sometime later. And um, 
So it was a, a, a terrible right situation in which you had um, what seemed to be an ecumenical council um, condemning the um, Orthodox and uh, um, upholding heresy. Basically the heresy already condemned because basically the same heresy as the Polinaris condemned by the second ecumenical council, the first council of Constantinople. All right, and then excommunicating the Pope. It, yeah, so this was about as bad as you can get. Um, but um, thanks be to God, um, there was a great Pope, St. Leo, who was also very courageous. And um, yeah, so Leo described this council as follows. By the rejection of that faith, which has crowned patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, the birth according to the flesh of Jesus Christ our Lord and the confession of his true death and resurrection, we shudder to say it, might be overthrown. The reason why he says that is because it denied the full humanity of Christ, right? Saying one composite nature in, so basically this composite nature would be the divine, essentially, right? The idea, again, of some kind of blend um, in which Jesus um, wouldn't have had a rational soul, apparently. It's not clear exactly how Eutyches is thinking of this or the council, the robber council either. So anyway, the situation is about as grave as a hundred years earlier in the fourth century with the Aryan crisis. And we saw in the middle of the fourth century about half the bishops of the Catholic world were Aryans or more than half. And so similarly here, you have the majority of bishops signing this blank paper that ended up condemning the Orthodox Bishop of Constantinople. So what happened? Fortunately, God intervened and the emperor died. So apparently, I, I forget the details, but I think he was out on a hunting expedition and had a tragic accident. But in any case, um, God so arranged it that um, the next um, um, emperor, Theodosius, was in fact, um, um, the next yeah, emperor was, was um, favorable to the Orthodox faith, right? And he had the body of Flavian buried with honor in Constantinople and the exiled bishops, the Orthodox bishops were recalled from exile and reinstated. And so they called a new council, this is two years later, and this is the council of Chalcedon, right? The fourth ecumenical council and one of the greatest. So um, 630 bishops attended, that's quite a good number, not as much as Vatican II, but the, I guess the largest um, up until then. Um, and the, um, the two Roman legates were received with honor. Right? They um, opened the council as, right, since they're representing the, the See of Peter and the head of all the churches. And they read the tome of Leo, right? And Dioscorus was, um, was basically deposed for having excommunicated the, the Pope, for having um, done the previous council, um, disregarding all the canonical regulations. All right, and then when Leo's tome was read, there was a famous um, line by the, the bishops, the assembled bishops, they cried out, this is the faith of the fathers, this is the faith of the apostles, so we all believe, thus did the Orthodox believe, anathema to him who does not thus believe. Peter has spoken thus through Leo. So taught the apostle. That's, that's a famous line. Peter has spoken through Leo. So this is important for all kinds of reasons, right? Above all for Christology, but also for ecclesiology, because it shows the, um, the primacy of Peter in the middle of the first millennia. Right? That Peter is there, the successor of Peter, Leo, is being recognized as rightfully presiding, even though he's not there, through his two legates and his letter being received, right, as the voice of Peter. And so they, um, they deposed, they condemned Dioscorus, the Patriarch of Alexandria. Um, Warren Carroll has a nice line on this. Warren Carroll, an historian, founder of Christendom College, he has a um, uh, four volume series of the history of Christendom. And in it, he says this, Pope Leo had little to fear from Attila the Hun, right? So Leo was Pope when Attila the Hun invaded Italy and came to Rome, the gates of Rome, and for whatever reason, didn't enter with his troops, thanks be to God, and didn't uh, pillage Rome. Um, and, and Leo went out to him. But in any case, Warren Carroll says that he had less to fear from Attila the Hun 
than from Dioscorus, right? For it was with those who denied the fullness of Christ's salvific human nature that the ultimate battle of that age was fought. Right? So Leo's tone, it's maintaining the unity of person while distinguishing the, the two natures, each of which retain their own properties. And so right now as well, Jesus as true God has all the attributes of God and as true man has all the properties of human nature. Even though he's in glory, he still has all proper human functions, a human intellect, a human will, human emotions, human flesh. So Leo says this, the character of each nature, therefore being preserved and united in one person, humility was assumed by majesty. I love that. Weakness by strength. Mortality, right? human mortality was assumed by eternity. Right? In other words, by the eternal person of the word. And in order to pay the debt of our condition, that is the debt of all human sin, the inviolable nature, the divine nature, was united to a nature subject to suffering, human nature. So that as was fitting for our healing, one in the same mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus could die in one nature, human, and not die in the other, divine. Therefore the true God was born in the complete and perfect nature of true man. Complete in his nature, divine, and complete in ours. Right, so that's the orthodox thing. Complete in humanity with intellect, will, emotions, flesh, all the human um, faculties. But nevertheless, as man, he wasn't subject to original sin and thus um, was, um, so we, like us in all things, except sin. So that's where we get that phrase from, from Leo's tome and from the Council of Chalcedon. And, and what that means is he um, didn't have original sin either, nor the concupiscence that we experience. But nevertheless, he had um, complete and perfect human nature as, um, as we will have right in the resurrection. And of course, it was subject to death and suffering. So it wasn't um, exactly like in the garden, right, where they were immune from death. Jesus had, a, had to have a humanity um, capable of maximally suffering and dying. Okay. So he continues, the son of God, descending from his heavenly throne, enters into the infirmities of this world and not leaving his, the father's glory. He is generated in a new order and a new birth, right? Human, human birth. In a new order because invisible in his own, divine nature, he was made visible in ours. Being incomprehensible in his divine nature, he wished to be comprehended. I love that. Right? He wanted to be comprehended and known and seen. While remaining prior to time, he began to exist in time. The Lord of the universe, concealing the immensity of his majesty, assumed the form of a slave. This was our, uh, our second reading today in the Mass of Palm Sunday um, from Philippians chapter 2. The impassable God did not disdain to be man subject to suffering, nor the immortal one to be subject to the laws of death. He is generated, however, by a new birth because an inviolate virginity, right? Mary's virginity, not knowing concupiscence has supplied the matter of the flesh. Nor does the Lord Jesus Christ born from the womb of a virgin have a nature different from ours just because his birth was miraculous. Yes, he has a miraculous birth, but what he took on was like us in everything we said, but sin. For he who is true God is likewise true man. And there is no falsehood in this unity in which the lowliness of man and the height of divinity coincide. It's so beautiful. God is not changed by his compassion. So the divinity isn't lowered, right? We speak that way, self-emptying, but what we mean by that is precisely that he took on, right? He took on our nature in which to suffer. So God isn't changed by his compassion, nor is the man, that is the truth of his humanity, swallowed up by the dignity of the divinity. Right? And he acts through both of those natures, right? which remain distinct principles of operation. So what, that sounds difficult, but it's, it's a simple idea. As God, he works, right? he's omnipotent and works miracles. As man, he does what we do, 
and that is sleeps, eats, wonders, and thinks, talks, and suffers and dies. Right? Each nature does what is proper to each in communion with the other. So that's really the summary right there. We could say the summary statement of Leo's tome to Flavian and of the Council of Chalcedon. Each nature does what is proper to each, right? So the divinity does what's proper to the divinity, upholding the world and being, right? governing the stars. But the humanity does what's proper to it, and that is thinks with the human intellect and loves with the human heart, right? That's why we have devotion to the sacred heart. But nevertheless, each one is in communion with the other, and that is his will never was out of communion, his human will with his divine will. Right? thus never sinning and always um, accepting freely the Father's will. And likewise with his human intellect, always working in communion with his divine intellect. And we'll talk more about that in the next three talks, right? We'll have a whole series on Jesus's human intellect because that's a difficult topic and important. Okay, so Leo says, each nature does what is proper to each in communion with the other, the word does what pertains to the word and the flesh to what pertains to the flesh. One shines forth with miracles, right? The divine nature heals the leper, etc., quiets the wind and the rain, the tempest. The other succumbs to injuries. And just as the word doesn't depart from equality with the father's glory, just so the flesh does not abandon the nature of our race. So here's the, the definition of the council. So what we just read was Leo's tome, his letter, and then the council itself and its decree and said this, following the Holy Fathers, we unanimously teach and confess one in the same son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity, perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly man, composed of a rational soul and body against the polar arms consubstantial with the father as to his divinity, consubstantial with us as to his humanity. Like us in all things but sin. He was begotten from the father before all ages as to his divinity. And in these last days, that is 2000 years ago, for us and for our salvation was born as to his humanity of the Virgin Mary, mother of God, right? Repeating that title of Mary from the council of Ephesus, mother of God. We confess that one in the same Christ, Lord, and only begotten son is to be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, change, division, or separation. And that's really the key sentence there. We'll come back to it in just a second. The distinction between the natures was never abolished by their union, but rather the character proper to each of the two natures was preserved as they came together in one person and one hypostasis. Hypostasis is simply the Greek term for person. They've got two terms. We basically have one. And, all right, so the key line there is without confusion, change, division, or separation. And that was taken from St. Cyrus letter that we looked at earlier. The letter that um, said without confusion, change, and likewise, no division and no severing of the two natures. Right? And so basically, this is adopting Cyril's terminology here, but not the, the, um, the one incarnate nature, right? so it, it, um, which led to Menop, the, the heresy. Right? Um, so when it says without confusion, that's um, eliminating the error of Apollinaris or Eutyches, and likewise, without change. But when it says without division or separation, it's... Um, condemning the heresy of Nestorius, right? So one in the same phrase there, without confusion and change, condemns the one error, one naturism, and without division or separation, condemns the opposite extreme, Nestorius. Now let's just reflect on this a little bit. So as I mentioned before, both, ex both sides of this heresy ended up um, really with the, same presupposition, maybe they didn't think about it, it was just something they both took for granted. And that was, look, person and nature always go together. Um, and that's true in human experience, right? Each one of us um, 
is a human person, and each one of us has only one nature. So each one of us, every human being, is one person and one nature, human nature, and each one of us is, and we never encounter anyone with two natures in one person. And, and so that's what makes this difficult, because we're dealing with something above nature, right? We're dealing with something that is um, mysterious, right? Because it's um, something that only has happened once and will never happen again, right? There's only one person in the universe who has two natures, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason he does this is to save us, right? Basically, the first, our first talk a long time ago, um, nine months ago now, or six months ago, um, we looked at the reasons of fittingness, right? And it was precisely to save us, one needs to be both God and man in one person, right? And so it's something taken on for our salvation, but not natural and not part of our normal experience. And therefore, rationalists, that is people who want to or think too much with the, argue with the imagination are gonna have trouble with this, right? Because it's not something we encounter in our human experience. Um, but um, it's neither is it something impossible, right? So that's what we, um, and we do have an analogy, right? The best analogy is each one of us has a nature that is in fact composite, right? We're weird beings, human beings, because we've got physical bodies and spiritual souls, right? It's true that makes up only one nature, human nature, but nevertheless, we can see that our nature has two parts to it that are very different. And that's the best analogy for the incarnation, right? The difference though is in the incarnation, it's not two parts of one nature, it's two infinitely different natures divine and human, um, in which a divine person who has always existed in divine nature takes on a human nature in time, never to relinquish it. All right, so both Nestorius and Eutyches held that this principle, nature and person have to go together. And therefore, either Christ has to be one person in one incarnate nature, that's the heresy of Eutyches, or one naturism, the fancy term is monophysitism, sorry about that, monophysite, meaning one nature, um, or on the opposite side, if there are two natures, there's got to be two persons, and that's the heresy of Nestorius and the Nestorians, and so basically, you can fall off the mountain on either side, right, but the Catholic truth is the mountaintop, where you say both, um, both things, um, one person, in two natures. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is helpful, but this, in the following century, one of the great theologians of the sixth century, Leontius of Byzantium, uh, makes a parallel between two earlier heretics with regard to the Trinity and these two heresies with regard to the incarnation. So he says, Eutyches stands in the same relation to Nestorius, they're right, opposites, on the subject of the incarnation as Sibelius does to Arius on the Trinity. And so if you remember Trinitarian theology, Sibelius was a heretic who basically denied the distinction of persons in God, in the Trinity, right? And his idea was, look, there's one divine nature and so for there can't be three persons. They're just three modes of action. So he likewise thought nature and person have to go together in the Trinity. And if there's one nature, there's got to be one person, Sibelius. Right, that's wrong. It's also called modalism. The opposite heresy was Arius that we looked at two times ago. And Arius basically said, all right, two persons, father and son, there's got to be a difference of natures. Only the father is the true God and the son is a lesser God, right? And so Arius not only distinguished the persons, but also the natures such that only one of them, the father, would be the true God, capital G. And Jesus, the son, would be small g God, a different nature. And so they've fallen in opposite ways, thinking, again, person and nature have to go together. There are two persons, there are two natures, or if there's just one nature, there's just one person. All right, same thing happened here with regard to the incarnation, right? And the story is thinking, um, if there's 
two natures, there gotta be two persons. So he, he makes the, um, the one person into two. And the opposite, Eutyches, mixes up the natures, thinking if there's one person, there's gotta be just one blended nature, right? And both are wrong, right? Um, so we could say that both of them are erring in putting a philosophical principle above revealed truth. Right? And that's a subtle temptation. And the philosophical principle here would be person and nature have to go together. And they trusted in that philosophical principle over the sources of revelation and over the ecumenical council, Chalcedon and the tomb of Leo. And tragically, many of the Monophysites, that's the one nature um, from Egypt, um, didn't accept the council. And so there was a tragic history to the council. But we could say that both extremes, whether Nestorius on the one hand, Nestorius also, um, uh, so both of the councils, Ephesus and Chalcedon, led to um, schisms in the church, or we could say heresies, that continued. And um, Nestorianism on the one hand, and the Monophysites on the other. And so it was uh, very tragic for the unity of the church. But again, it's interesting that even though they're opposites, in many ways, they two extremes end up touching one another, right? As so often happens in both theology and um, the political sphere as well. So both positions would make it impossible for Christ to be the true mediator between God and man. So let's see if we can understand this. In, in order for Jesus to be the perfect mediator, he's got to be in both natures while remaining one. Right? To be a perfect meter, he's got to unite the two extremes that he wants to reconcile. So he's got to be true God and true man at the same time. And he's got to be one person to be the bridge between God and man. Right? And so if you deny the unity, there's no mediator. Right? There are two mediators. And so that won't help us. Um, there wouldn't be a single mediator. And likewise, if you deny the humanity, he can't properly mediate either because he wouldn't share our nature and therefore properly be our head and be able to represent us with the father, right? So he's got to be in both natures while remaining one person. And that's the point that St. Leo makes. What reconciliation could there be in which God might be made propitious to the human race if the mediator between God and men didn't take upon himself the cause of all men, right? And he takes on us, on himself, the cause of all men by becoming man, right? And thus undergoing death so that the bonds of death might be loosed by the death of one who alone was in no way subject to death, right? By being God made man. And another lesson is the danger of party spirit, right? The danger of being too fanatical, a partisan of any one theological school and especially putting that above an ecumenical council and the Bishop of Rome, right? And again, same, we said the same thing last time with Nestorius. It's so important to look not at who says it, but what is being said. And then even there, not so much the words, but what is the meaning? And then it's so important to strive in charity to interpret benevolently and give an orthodox interpretation. Yeah. Right? So St. Sorrow used, misleading terminology, but one should read him benevolently. Okay. And then also how important it is to make use of a good philosophy. Theology needs the handmaiden of philosophy, right? And it's ultimately always gonna be the philosophy of common sense, right? We don't need technical philosophy so much as a philosophy that's true to common sense experience of mankind. And then putting revelation um, above. Okay. Yeah, because both Nestorius and the Monophysites put their erroneous philosophy over revelation, right? seeking to interpret the revelation in the light of their mistaken principle. Whereas Leo and Cyril use the right theological method, 
right? And that is to start with what Revelation teaches us about Christ, the mediator between God and man. Right? And especially the, what we said, the three fundamental attributes, he's perfect God, he's perfect man, and he's one nature. Uh, I'm sorry, and he's one person. Oh, I just fell into the, the not the side here saying that. One person um, in the two natures. Right, and so Leo sums it up. He wouldn't be the mediator between God and men unless the same God and the same man were one, right? In both aspects, one in person. Okay. Right. So yeah, the tragic history after the Council of Chalcedon is that Egypt never accepted, right? And um, Dios, Dioscuros was um, deposed and a new bishop took his place, but he got murdered. Um, by the populace. And, um, and so Egypt remained um, uh, mostly monophysite. And so the emperors were constantly trying to bring the um, uh, unity by making compromises. So this led to the, um, I'm gonna say just briefly about the next heresy. Sorry, we're doing a lot in this hour, but um, so the Byzantine emperors after this council, Right, which was so marvelous. Nevertheless, um, part of Christendom has, um, is not accepting it. And so in order to bring them back, the emperors tried to make compromises in which basically the Monophysites and the Catholic position would be um, uh, brought together. And the way that this, um, they tried to do this was with regard to a, a question um, about um, Jesus's wills or operations. So th this goes back to what we said earlier, that in Jesus, each nature does what is proper to it in communion with the other, right? And so that means that Jesus Christ has, um, as man, human operations, and as God, divine operations, but they're in communion with one another. And so we have to say that Jesus, therefore, has two wills and two different ways of operating, humanly and divinely, but coming together um, in harmony or communion. Right? That's the difficulty. And so um, those who are holding a one nature kind of position, that is um, the province of Egypt, um, didn't like that way of speaking about two modes of action. And so they put forth, no, there's just one divine human way of acting and therefore just one will, which would be the divine, All right? So this would be the next heresy called one willism. There's a fancy Greek word, monothelitism, but that just simply is Greek for one willism, right? And, and so, does it matter? Yes. Right. So again, at first sight, one might think, oh, what do I care whether Jesus has one will or two wills as long as he's my savior? Sometimes like that might seem pious. But the fact is, how is he my savior? He's my savior because his human will loved me, loved us to the death. And so in fact, our salvation depends on the truth of Jesus Christ having a true human will, right? This is the sacred heart. Right? The sacred heart is how we show devotion to Jesus's human love for us by which he consented to the cross. He consented to die for us. So this is in fact, yes, something to die for. Um, now in the, so this is a heresy came up in the seventh century, right? So the 600s, the beginning. And um, the emperor was trying to make some kind of compromise. And, um, and he thought that the Monophysites would come back into union with the Catholic Church if they were permitted to say that Jesus had only one operation in will, which would be the divine. Right? So that's what the, the Byzantine emperor and the, the patriarch of Constantinople are trying to push on the Pope at this time. And in fact, they um, misled the Pope at this time. Um, his name was... Um, Honorius, yeah. So the patriarch of Constantinople, his name is Sergius, managed to deceive the Pope of Rome at this time, Honorius I, 
Um, and so the Patriarch Castillo wrote to um, Honorius asking him to allow um, people to say there's only one will in Christ. Um, in other words, kind of, let's just be quiet about this and not worry about it. We'll accept those who say one will and those who say two wills, and we won't make a big deal about it, something like that. And um, Honorius apparently was led astray because he thought, he interpreted the question differently. He thought that by saying one will, he, it meant that Christ's human will always willed the same thing as his divine will, right? And that's true. In other words, Jesus' will, human will was always one with his divine will. But nevertheless, there are two different wills because one is eternal and the other is in time. One is divine and the other is human. And yes, they're always in harmony, but, um, but they're two, um, two different um, natures that they're operating from. I, so Pope Honorius made a, a big mistake here. Um, and this is one of the cases that was looked into um, when the, um, in the 19th century, when the definition of papal infallib infallibility was promulgated, right, to make sure that Honorius mm -hmm. didn't violate um, papal infallibility. Um, and so, yes, in, he wrote a, a letter to the patriarch of Constantinople in which he um, basically said that one could say one will, right? As long as one meant um, the two wills were always in harmony, it seems. But in any case, um, the, the doctrine of one will in Christ is a heresy and was condemned by Honorius's successors infallibly, right? And it was taught um, by um, Pope St. Martin I, um, who died a martyr precisely because of this. And likewise, it was taught by St. Maximus the Confessor, who had, um, who yes, also died a martyr because of uh, defending Christ's two wills. And that got defined in the first, um, in the Lateran Synod of uh, the middle of the seventh century, and then by the next ecumenical council. And right? so the key point is Christ as true man has to have a human will. So if he doesn't have a human will, he's not true man, right? Just as if he didn't have a human intellect, he wouldn't be true man. And, um, and it's precisely his human will that merited our salvation. So St. Maximus, who was, um, he ended up having his tongue cut out so that he couldn't defend the, the Catholic faith. And, um, and I think his hands cut off as well um, and died from it. He, um, this is one of his great um, points of def is defending that there are two wills right, in Christ, human and divine, but always in harmony. And he says, if we were to deny this, Christ wouldn't be properly human, but would be some kind of mythical creation foreign to us. And furthermore, we see that Jesus has a human will in Gethsemane. And so let's look at that a little bit. And so St. Maximus says, the Logos showed himself with perfect, the Logos himself showed with perfect clarity that he had a human will by nature, just as he also had by essence a divine one. In that very human prayer of his in Gethsemane, uttered as part of his incarnate existence for us, in which he prayed to be spared from death, if it be possible, right? He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Right? And that's an expression, therefore, there of his natural will, because Jesus, just like every other human being, has a natural inclination to avoid um, being crucified, right? to avoid death and intense suffering. But what does he say right afterwards, right? Not my will, but your will be done. And that's his human consent, right? And so Maximus um, used that precisely to show that he's humanly willing to do the Father's will, right? Precisely when he says, not my will, so when he says, not my will, what he's referring to there is his natural desire right, to avoid death. So that, not that, but your will, that is that I die on the cross, be done. And those words be done are his deliberate human will. Each one, in each one of us, we can distinguish a natural will, and that is our natural desires, and our deliberate will, which is what we actually choose after we deliberate. And it's the second that's free, 
right? Our natural desires aren't free. They're built into our nature. But what's free is our free consent, right? To do the Father's will, right? And so each one of us can speak like Jesus, right? Not my will, that is not my natural inclination, but your will be done. And as Maximus points out in this, he offered himself to us as a model, right? And a norm for putting away our own uh, wills, that is our, our natural inclinations to fulfill God's will perfectly, right? Even if we see death threatening as a result, as was the case for St. Maximus, right? In getting his tongue cut out. All right, so this heresy got condemned in the Lateran Council of 649 under St. Martin. And by the way, St. Martin was also exiled precisely for this the following year and um, exiled and basically starved to death and, and killed. Um, and so the council stated, if anyone doesn't confess properly and truly two wills, divine and human, intimately united in one and the same Christ, our God, and since it is one and the same who by each of his natures wills our salvation, let him be condemned. Right? In other words, Jesus loved us as God from all eternity and as man with a human heart, right? And that's really important because it's as man that he consented to die for us. And in the same way, we could say Jesus has two kinds of operations, divine operations and human operations, right? And they're intimately united in harmony. But nevertheless, we have to distinguish them, right? The human operation is infinitely different than the divine operation. Okay, let me skip that. And um, this got um, the the Lateran Synod is um, I'd say an infallible judgment because the Pope was there, but it wasn't an ecumenical council because the emperor was opposed to this, and you had to wait until the emperor died. Right, just as we saw earlier with the Council of Chalcedon, the emperor who was supporting one willism ended up dying, and then it was possible to hold a, an ecumenical council, which is the um, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, the um, Constantinople III, under Pope Saint Agatha, and it was confirmed um, then later by um, uh, Pope Saint Leo II. So Pope Agatha um, basically um, further developed the Christology of the Council of Chalcedon. Right, it's, it's the same doctrine, but just makes more specific that the um, that Jesus. So let's read, the holy and inseparable Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is of one deity, of one nature, one substance or essence. We also proclaim that Trinity is one natural will, one strength, one lordship, one operation, majesty, power, and glory. That is the three divine persons have one will, right? There's not a different will, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's one glorious divine will for the three divine persons, one majesty for the three divine persons one power and one glory. However, when we confess two natures and two natural wills and two natural operations and our one Lord, and that's because he's got two natures. So the Trinity has one will, but Jesus, right? Christ has two. And that's because he's got the one divine will, which he shares with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he's got his human will. And yes, that human will was always in harmony with his divine will but it's human, right? Now, this is one of the, yeah, so a similar thing happened for St. Agatha as happened for St. Leo at the Council of Chalcedon, right? The fathers of the council said, Peter has spoken through Agatha in the same way that they'd said, Peter has spoken through Leo. Um, and it's basically Leo's insight, two natures that always remain distinct, um, but they, and each one has its own properties and therefore its own operations and therefore its own will, but always an intimate communion, one with the other. And so here too, the, the council, uh, third council of Constantinople says two natures that undergo no confusion, no change, no separation, no division. The same four things that we saw with Cyril and the Council of Kelsey. So what are the implications 
And Jesus simply wouldn't have been true man if he didn't have a human will, right? And because he has to share our nature. And it's, he came to heal above all the human will, right? Because our, it's our will by which we love or fail to love, right? It's our will by which we merit or demerit. It's our will by which we sin or, um, or refrain from sin, right? And so Jesus had to assume a human will precisely to heal it because that's where we most need to be healed. And that's where we most can be divinized. I divinized by um, being given a share of the divine love. Okay. Um, redemption would be impossible right, if Christ didn't take on a human will because his passion is meritorious in coming from a free human consent. Right? And that's exactly what we see in Gethsemane. And that's why that dialogue in Gethsemane is so important. And Jesus wanted it to be witnessed, right? He brought John and Peter, James, and John with him, right? his three closest disciples, and he has to wake them up three times so that they, right, so that they can be witnesses to his consent, right, to that prayer. Father, if it be possible, right, but not my will, your will be done. And then we could say, if Jesus didn't have a human will, um, then he couldn't be the model for us, right, because he's the model for, above all, through his will, always choosing and with the Father, exactly as he does at Gethsemane. All right, and that's that. So let's, let's leave it there and take a few minutes and um, write in your questions. Okay. And um, let's start in with the questions. So yeah, just write them in on the chat or um, you can also just raise your hand if you wish. Um, so a question here from Gabrielle. Sadly, Christianity has been riddled with so many heresies and independent thought, almost without end, even to this day. Was Hebrew teaching as susceptible to such erroneous overthinking and divisions? And if so, are Christianity's many divisions somehow caused, foreshadowed by differences contained within the law? Yeah, good question. And so, it, yes, um, um, Christianity has had, yes, all different um, kinds of heresies, opposite kinds, right? And so did Judaism and does, right? And that's not surprising. Um, it's not surprising because in so many things, divine revelation is um, a synthesis of, um, of things that come together um, mysteriously, right? And the human tendency is um, again to um, to tend to separate, to go for one side or the other. And um, yes, the history of Judaism showed lots of different heresies even before the incarnation, right? And that would be, for example, the Sadducees and the Pharisees um, showed um, very um, differences with regard to fundamental doctrines. Right? And in fact, the Pharisees were on the right side of those um, disputes. The Sadducees denied um, the resurrection of the body, right? And we see this in the Acts of the Apostles, right? When St. Paul is speaking to a Jewish audience, he, he knows that there's a dispute among them. And he says right out, he's on the side of the Pharisees with regard to the resurrection of the body. Um, and, and the Sadducees also seemingly denied um, uh, well, I guess that would be the most important thing, but they also deny the normativity, the canonicity of the prophets, right? Holding only the uh, a shorter canon of the books of Moses, the five books. And so that's a huge difference with regard to the sources of revelation. Um, and so we can see within, and then there were lots of other um, sects at the time of Jesus as well within the Jewish world, um, maybe not as prominent as the Pharisees and the um, the Sadducees, there were the Essenes, and we've come to know a lot more about them through the um, Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so I think it's just normal. And the reason for this is that just as there are many, many schools of philosophy, right? When, um, the same thing would be true about Revelation if there wasn't some way to guarantee um, some infallible magisterium. In other words, this is precisely a great argument of fittingness for having an infallible magisterium. St. John Henry Newman makes this case very beautifully 
in his um, Apologia Pro Vita Su, his autobiography, and also in his essay on the development of, um, of Christian doctrine, where he, um, he basically goes through different, you know, the kind of development of doctrine and shows if you didn't have an infallible magisterium to keep the church on track, right, um, we would be as split, right, as the Protestant world. Um, and so it's such a blessing that there is, in fact, the, um, yeah, the gift of a magisterium, right, in the church that keeps her one in these disputes. And that's what the history of the church teaches again and again, especially in the first millennium. What's so surprising is, yes, you get all these different heresies, right, but that the councils, the orthodox councils that are accepted, not the robber council, but the real councils, show such a unified doctrine, right? Even though they're, you know, they're held in the East for the most part, nevertheless, the papal legates are putting in the, the Latin perspective and um, both East and West are coming together in all of these ecumenical councils of the first millennia. And again, in perfect harmony. And um, even though large sectors of the church end up being separated for time, coming back in unity, being separate again, coming back in unity, nevertheless, we see that continuity of, of teaching in the ecumenical councils and in the, the papal doctrines. Right? And, and yes, an individual pope might err in what he says that's not properly um, said um, from the seat of Peter. In other words, a pope can err as a private theologian. Right? But what he says in a solemn definition, that's another matter, right? And there again, the history of the church shows that both ecumenical councils and papal um, decisions that have the three, so there are three characteristics basically that a, um, a papal teaching has to have to be infallible. It has to be speaking as the successor of Peter um, on a matter of faith and morals and declaring it as definitive. Right? And when those things, and the same thing is true of an ecumenical council, when those things come together, right, the teaching is infallible. And what we see in 2000 years of church history is that we don't find um, contradictions. There are difficulties there. Yes, no doubt there are lots of difficulties, but they um, admit of um, resolution. And the same thing would, is clearly true of Judaism, right? It needed and so it had a certain kind of magisterium, which was prophetic or charismatic, right? And that was the succession of prophets. But those prophets, right, no longer, that succession no longer exists. And so Israel doesn't, you could say that Judaism doesn't have the same kind of um, supernatural and um, infallible magisterium. Nevertheless, there's the rabbinical tradition, right, which um, serves to provide a unity. Um, of doctrine to the Jewish world. Did Apollinarianism hold that Christ's human nature was replaced or blended with the divine? And um, blended. So basically Apollinaris held that it's um, the logos and the flesh coming together to make Christ's um, um, composite nature. And so divine logos, taking the place of the rational soul, right? And that's simply, that's not, that's contradictory because the divine nature can't um, serve as the um, animating principle of a body, right? Because a body is in time and the divine nature is not in time. The divine nature mysteriously can assume a human nature, but all, a complete human nature, yeah. not a blend. Did Eutyches die in union or out of union with church? I think out of union, um, tragically, but I, I don't know for sure. Yeah. It's from David. Jesus identified as a divine person, but since he is true man and true God, why could he not also be identified as a human person? I've heard theologians call me a human person, though I suspect it was wrong. I couldn't explain why. Okay, so, and we have to be careful the way we speak. And again, many people, who um, think rightly can sometimes use language that's misleading, right? And we saw the great Saint Cyril of Alexandria, one of the greatest um, fathers, um, did use a misleading language on this, on the in the opposite way. And so I, I think yes, it, it would be misleading language, but not necessarily unorthodox thought to to say to speak of Jesus as a human person. The um, the reason why we ought not we ought to avoid that 
is because you don't want to speak in such a way that implies that there are two persons, a human person and a divine person, as if they made up two subjects. That's precisely the Nestorian heresy. Um, but if a person simply means that Jesus Christ is true man and, um, and therefore um, he's a human person, taking that to mean he's a human being, then the thought would be orthodox. But again, better not to use that term. All right? Um, yes, and so again, always look at what the person is intending to say. Um, it's difficult because certainly Jesus Christ is truly man, right? And we speak of um, human beings and human persons interchangeably. It's just that by person, we mean one who is incommunicable. A person, per, all persons are incommunicable. Sorry, that's a fancy term. What that means is I can't be shared with another. Um, I'm my own subject. Um, Whereas nature is precisely something that can be shared. We all share human nature, but we can't share Larry Feingoldness or David Mossness or et cetera, Bob Lozano-ness, et cetera. And we each have that personally. It's not shareable. And so Jesus, his humanity, in fact, is not incommunicable because it's precisely, it was assumed by the Logos. And so Jesus' humanity isn't its own subject. That's why we don't want to speak of a human person in Christ, because it would imply that he's his own subject as a man, even if the person doesn't intend to say that and wouldn't, in fact, be a heretic at all. But nevertheless, the term would imply that. What because about the divine person? Why does Yes, he... absolutely. He's a divine person. Jesus is a divine person, because from all eternity, right, you have a divine person there, and that divine person assumes the human person. In other words, the, the divine right. person isn't communicable um, in the sense of belonging to another higher than him. But the human nature is assumed precisely by a pre-existing person. And it doesn't constitute its own person, but is taken up into the unity of that pre-existing divine person. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's not something to fight over because probably the thought of the person speaking that way is perfectly orthodox. And, but there are certain rules for speaking about right, Christology and that would be one of them. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. And I'm sorry, I didn't do justice to that. And question here from Robert. I guess because of the many heresies and divisions throughout church history, maybe the Protestant division, which always seems so tragic and which we're living with to this day, is just one more of many events in history as sad as it was. Yes, that's true, right? The first millennium shows terrible, terrible divisions within Christianity, right? The, um, the Monophysites, but before that, so the Gnostics, that's the first terrible, I mean, and there were so many different Gnostic sects and their difference was much greater right, compared to Catholic teaching than that between Protestants and Catholics. And so they led into much greater errors, right, anti-Jewish errors, etc. Anti, you know, goodness of creation errors. Um, and then with Arianism, yes, that what a terrible rift that was. Um, and it survived for centuries, for the most part, outside of the Roman Empire. Um, and so the barbarian tribes, the Germanic tribes, um, were evangelized by Arians and became Arian. Um, and, and that lasted, yes, for centuries. The, um, the Monophysites, well, before that, the Nestorians continue to this day, right? And so there's still Nestorians. I think in the theological difference is mostly not present, um, but you have, still have that legacy. And then with the Monophysites as well. And, but maybe the most painful of all was the um, rift in the 11th century with the Eastern Orthodox. Um, again, surviving to this day, even though we're so close Right, in, in just about everything. Um, but um, yes, and so the Protestant division um, is not the only one. But in some ways, um, it's especially tragic because it split up the unity of the faith in Europe in a way that hadn't happened, um, or it split up that unity of the Catholic faith. And so it, it very much led, um, speeded up, we could say, other tendencies of dissolution and that would be the rise of modern atheism. So um, obviously Protestants aren't responsible for that directly, but the, the splitting up of Christendom um, made that much more 
um, uh, accelerate that tendency, um, and thus this secularism that we see in so many ways in our contemporary world. And also another tragedy of Protestantism was that it attacked the sacramental principle, right, in a way that other heresies hadn't, right? And so um, Monophysitism and Nestorianism, none of these heresies attacked the sacramental doctrine of the church, right? And so that's why the Nestorians, the Monophysites, and then the Eastern Orthodox were all one with regard to the sacraments. The differences are just superficial. And that means the hierarchical structure of the church remained intact, even though there was lost the communion with Peter. Um, and so the Protestantism touched a much deeper core in attacking the very, attacking holy orders, right? And, um, and with holy orders, the sacramental system, except for baptism. And matrimony, yeah. So that was, yes, it has a special, it is especially tragic for that reason. Um, um, Christian from Mariella, all of these heresies seem to be a departure from the witness of the apostles who written the gospels. Is it fair simply to call them philosophies developed in departure from the apostles teaching? Um, well, I guess they're not, they're properly um, theological rather than um, philosophies, but they're making use of philosophy. In other words, um, all of these heresies are making claims about revelation, about the interpretation of revelation. And so that's properly theology. But in making these claims about the interpretation of revelation, um, unfortunately, yes, they're departing from the witness of the gospels, but of course, gospels are not so easy to interpret. Um, and, and in departing from the witness of the gospels, they're preferring, they're departing on account of some philosophical presupposition. So I think you're, you're quite right in that, saying that. Um, and that's, but it, it ultimately shows the necessity of a magisterium, right? We need an infallible magisterium that helps keep us true precisely to the teaching of the apostles and the gospels and tradition therefore, which grows and lives in the church. Um, and yes. Thanks be to God, we've got that gift of the magisterium. So from Robert, is Jesus' human nature different from before the crucifixion and after his resurrection? Great question. And the answer is no. Right? We want to say that he's, human nature is human nature, but he has a different state of human nature, and that is glorified. Right? We don't have that state yet. Right? So we have... Um, as of yet unglorified human bodies and human nature, um, and Jesus has glorified. Um, but it's the same human nature, and it's in fact the same body that Jesus has today at the right hand of the Father as that which was conceived in Mary's womb, right, born in Bethlehem, um, nailed to the cross on Calvary, and which rose. So we want to hold the continuity of same body, and certainly same human nature, but a new glorious state, which is the cause of our hope, right? And that's the cause of Easter joy. Great. From Bob, seems like the phrase inviolate virginity, not knowing concupiscence from the Tome of Leo is a magisterial reference or perhaps even a statement of the Immaculate Conception. Is that true? If so, was it the first? Well, I wouldn't want to go that far, but um, it's above all a statement of the um, of Mary's perpetual virginity, right? So she, her inviolate virginity, but not knowing concupiscence. Yes, I think you're right. That was in fact accepted pretty much by everyone um, from this time and even before this time. So um, it was commonly held by those who denied the Immaculate Conception, let's say in the, um, in the medieval scholastics, Thomas Aquinas, who denied the Immaculate Conception, he nevertheless held that Mary was, had the gift of what we call integrity, being exempt from concupiscence. And just about every other um, important theologian also held that. Um, the argument was about when was Mary fully sanctified, at the moment of her conception, or um, some point right after that, still in her mother's womb. Um, but, but yes, you're right to, to notice that, that's excellent. Um, and it again shows us that the Immaculate Conception really was much more of a commonly held doctrine if one focuses on 
um, the key points, which is Mary was sanctified from the womb um, and was exempt from the um, experiencing concupiscence as we experience it. Uh, the debate so was uh, you know, I was, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That, that's what I was wondering, just because, you know, in, in terms of this formal statement, it being fairly recent in the history of the church, and I've just heard general references, it was always believed for much longer, mm -hmm. and I just didn't know on what basis we would say that, that was all. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, anybody? Uh -huh. Mary? I'm going to try to unmute. Um, Dr. Feingold, you briefly mentioned, um, uh, like, we're called to be partakers in the divine nature, like that's part of the mystical body of Christ, but could you expand upon that and how, or is that just way off topic? <laughs> no, no, it's not off topic. I mean, Jesus is the model, right, for, for us, but um, so our divinization or sharing the divine nature happens by sanctifying grace, right? So we we receive sanctifying grace, and it enables our humanity to be elevated and to share in the divine nature. Um, and so, yes, Jesus is the model um, for us. But nevertheless, he's got something that we don't, and that's the hypostatic union. And that's what enables him to speak in the Gospels, making a divine claim, as we saw earlier, no, at length, so that he could say, you know, before Abraham was, I am. Um, he, we can't say that, he can say that, and that's because of the hypostatic union. But nevertheless, he's our model in that that union of divinity and humanity is what we're called to in this sense of growing in a sharing of the divine nature, right? And so we share in his sonship, but with this difference, we're adopted sons and daughters, and he's the natural one. Um, so, so yes, but we're gonna, in a future talk, I think it'll be our last one. We'll look at Jesus's at grace in his humanity. So Jesus too had sanctifying grace in his humanity, just he had the maximum, the absolute sanctifying grace. And yes, we're sharing in that. And he had it as head. He's our head, meaning that Jesus, everything that he received, he received in his humanity for us, for his mystical body. And we come to share little parts of it, right? We, and, and, even Mary, right? Mary shares in what Jesus had in full, um, such that she could always grow in it, right? Every day of her life. And we're called to do that too. Does that help? Could you say that, because mm -hmm. um, this is so, it's just, you know, we talk about the mystical body and it's just such a, 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 a hard concept that's so difficult. So from what you're saying, would you say that when we choose God's, you know, um, charity mm -hmm. and that we align our will to God's will, that that is like, that raises, that's kind of like, then we are sharing the divine nature when we choose God's will? Or, I mean, I'm just, it's just, I yeah. think, a good question. Right, let me see if I can. So, so there are two different things there. Sharing in the divine nature, sharing God's nature, is what we call sanctifying grace. Yes. So everyone who's in a state of grace is sharing in God's nature. All right. God is love, right? And so therefore, whoever is sharing in the divine nature is sharing in the divine power to love. But we're sharing um, according to degree. In other words, sharing or participating means to have in part. And to have in part means that we could have more in part and more and more. And so every participation admits of continual growth. And so if we're sharing in the divine nature, we're sharing the divine power to love, we can always grow more in that, right? Yeah. And so when we do love, as so Jesus gave us the new command, right? To love one another as I have loved you. All right. And when we do that to a certain extent, right? Yes, that's coming out of sanctifying grace and the gift of charity. But those gifts are given to us in such a way that we can resist them. Right? In other words, we can act in accordance with charity or we can tragically act against it. And by doing so gravely, we lose it. Yeah. By doing so in not gravely, we don't lose it. 
um, and that's called the venial sin. So, so yes, it's coming out of that sharing the divine nature, but it's properly an act that we do, acts of charity, okay? And yes, those acts are made possible by grace, sanctifying grace. I don't grace think understanding. It's, just, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> One way to think of it is, so St. Thomas tries to explain it like this. I'm not sure if this will help, but I'll give it a shot. And he makes the analogy of a, a rock. A rock's got rock nature. And because of rock nature, it's got an inclination to the center right, of the gravitational field. And then if there's nothing obstructing, it'll actually fall. So we can see there are three things, nature, inclination, and actual movement. All right, that's true in human nature. We've got human nature, we've got natural inclinations, and then we have our human acts. All right, if Christ in elevating us to the supernatural level has elevated all three of those. So elevating our nature, we call that sanctifying grace. That gives us a new nature as it were, not, not exactly, but it's like a new nature. That new sanctifying grace then gives us a supernatural inclination. The supernatural inclination is charity. Faith, hope, and charity actually give us our supernatural inclination. And then our acts, individual acts of believing, hoping, and loving, those are like the movement that leads us to heaven, right? So that's, so God equips us in all three of those, sanctifying grace, like a new nature, the gift of faith, open charity as habits that we have even when we're asleep, that give us a new inclination, and then enable us to act freely on the basis of those habits, and those would be our, our individual acts. And he gives us actual grace to make those individual acts. And in so doing, yes, we're all the members of the mystical body are living from Christ's life, as it were. And, um, and he's, um, we're growing in the full stature of Christ. And that's the goal of the spiritual life, right? And other than Christ is operating through us, right? He's able to touch um, others through those members of the mystical body that are living his life. Any other? All right, let's call it, uh, call it there in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for the gift of the incarnation, for having been born for us in humanity with a free human will that chose to love us to the death through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. And to you, have a wonderful Holy Week. True to all. Yeah. Easter. And we'll see you in two weeks. Happy Thanks. Easter. Likewise. Thank you. Happy Easter. Mm -hmm. Bye. God bless. God bless. And thanks, David, for doing this.